Good afternoon, friends. Welcome back to the House of Tone. My name is Wes Lee. I'm a bandist and repair technician. I started a YouTube channel to show what my life is like in the trades. I appreciate you stopping by. Well, today we're going to talk about clarinets. I've had several questions and emails asking me about clarinet repadding, how to go from start to finish on taking a clarinet apart, cleaning it, repadding it, recorking it, all the way to the end. So that's what we're going to do. I find it might be easier if I just talk as I go through. You won't watch the whole thing, but we'll hit all the highlights. Any technicians, if you have anything to add, add them to the comments. I like to read about other people's processes as well. I have a good friend, Ernie Arruda, up in Canada land, and he always throws in some really good tips and advice. So make sure in the comments that you see if Ernie put something down. Okay, let's take a look at the horn in question first. All right, let's open her up. Okay, beautiful no blame. It's very solid. Let's get this pulled out. It's got lots of crust on it. It's very typical. Lots of green buildup from cork grease and other sediment. A lot of buildup around there. Not too bad inside. And our pads are pretty shot. We've got a lot of buildup around the tenons, key, inside the chimneys. We've got a lot of funk in there we'll brush out. Got some green behind the thumb tube. Pretty standard stuff. Let's check the keys are that key is a little loose but these are not so bad I've already made sure that the hinge rods are not frozen so and down here same just worn out frosty everything needs to be polished okay so it's a good solid instrument these play really nice so what tools are needed in order to overhaul a clarinet from start to finish? Let's take a look at some of the items that I use. I'm going to put up a screenshot right in here, and I'll also list the part numbers down in the description from Freeze Tools. Let's take a look at some of this. We need screwdrivers to take these apart. These are made by Pisoni. These are a super high quality screwdriver. These are Swedish pliers. You buy them now. You have them 30 years later. This is a feeler gauge. This is a spring hook. This is a tenon cork remover. This is to measure your corks, variety of corks for your key corks, your tenon corks, cork cement. This is an assembly board. You have to be able to keep track of your screws and your hinge rides and where they go. This is my pad slick. Disregard that I drilled a 3 8 inch hole in the top of my pad slick. Mine does a lot of stuff. This is clear shellac. Blazer torch, it's a butane torch. Um, I've been using these for as long as I've been in business. A bench peg is a must have to be able to sand your tenon corks. This is the Rocher Thomas bore oil. I've been liking it a lot. For this particular instrument, we're going to be using white leather pads. You need an assortment of brushes to be able to get in the bore, get in the chimneys, get between the mechanisms and all that. And this is my favorite tool and I would say it's probably the number one tool. This is just a spring. And this is my poker. We made this as a project when I was in repair school. I've had it all this time so it's got a lot of sentimental value. I don't know if anyone sells this product. I just reload a new blue needle spring and keep going. But it always reminds me of my time at Red Wing. A lot of fond memories there. Let's jump into this repair. And removing these hinge rods. I suggest that you have an order for disassembly. I always start with the trill keys. Then I move on to the A flat. Now here's a tip. I use my thumb as a guide for the screwdriver. That way the screwdriver doesn't have a tendency to slip off.
you can do this one join at a time but after you've done them for so long you get to where you know the upper joint and lower joint keys and you can just take them all off and do it at the same time but don't feel bad if if you only do one joint at a time Now here's something to notice. There are two different styles of pivot screw, a headed and a headless. You want to make sure that you keep them separated and know where they go. They're done that way for a reason, so make sure that you keep them in the right spots and in the right orders. That's where having that assembly board, like the Faris assembly board, that's where it really comes in crucial because because you can use this and put where everything goes. These are great guides to be able to put all your screws and stuff. We made that in repair school and that's just what I've always used. The way that Gene Beckwith taught me and taught our class. Uh, this is what's ingrained in my brain so I don't use anything else. But uh, my assistant, Miss Miller Lee, she is using the assembly boards. So these are in use in our shop. Okay, let's get the pads out of here. Okay, so let's talk about some of the pads that we see here. We're going to look at the pad backs. Let's zoom in on this. The amount of glue that's on this pad is almost okay, but it's not enough. The glue that's on this pad is not enough. The glue that's on this pad is not enough. The entire pad back has to be covered so that you can float the pad in the pad cup. This looks like they put scotch tape or some kind of clear tape in there as well as adhesive. These pads will hold in, but there's not enough to float. So keep this in mind when we get to the, to the padding portion of our video. If we look at the pad, we can see that we had some seat here. We have seat definite here and no seat over here. So this, this pad was not seated in there. Okay, once I have the instrument disassembled, I want to try to hit some of the high points with just a brush before I even get it wet. See if I can get some of this gunk out or what will wipe off. I see there's some stuff inside the tone holes there. So I just use a soft nylon brush to get around both the lower and then the upper, upper joint. I have some water here to that water. I use Murphy's oil soap. That's just what I like. That's what I've been using for a really long time. So I just kind of go with it. I mix it in the water. I put the body down in. I don't leave the body in the water. I 
I wash the outside. I just make a slurry with the soapy water. Then I do the bore. I do the tenon corks. Make sure that you get inside all of the components, the thumb tube, inside the all of the chimneys. Then I have my rinse water. One thing that I also want to mention on the upper joint, make sure that you take a tiny little brush and get down in the register pip because you get a lot of corrosion and a lot of junk out of that. That's very important. That really affects the way that the horn speaks. Once you've got the body rinsed good, go ahead and dry it off. And now I'm going to repeat the process on all the other parts. After I get done with the Murphy's oil soap to clean up all the bits that are on it, I also then I dump this water. I'm going to repeat. I'm going to use a little bit of Dawn um, so that it uh, sanitizes it out. It's a little bit of an extra step since we've gone through the pandemic, uh, but I have also added that to my cleaning regimen on everything. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm not going to show you that. We'll just jump ahead in the video. Now as for our keys, we're going to soak these in Dawn and then I'm going to run them through my ultrasonic cleaner to get off a lot of this scale and build up and whatnot. And then I'm going to buff these so that they'll look new. Degrease, lime scale remove, ultrasonic clean. It's also important here to note the thickness of the cork material that is used on the keys because this is the foot thickness that you're going to mimic. So here's our keys after our bath. They came out looking really nice. Amazing just what cleaning them does before polishing. All that scale and green crust is just all gone. And so that makes the job of polishing the keys much, much easier. So let's go get our tenon cork set up and then we'll polish the keys. So this is a cool tool that is a cork stripper and it's got a little bit different angles on either side. But it allows you to get right up under and trim off all of this old cork and if you've got it peeling up it really helps to get in and clean all that You really want to make sure that you remove all the old glue. All right. Now we're going to come in and paint the cork and the tenon with cork cement. My preference is to do two to three thin coats. I try to keep it off the shoulders as much as I can based on the thicknesses that we had going that I pulled off. I'm going to glue up some of this 132nd. 
but it's good to have a variety of sheet cork sizes. While this is drying, let's go buff some keys. When you're buffing, make sure you're staying between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Turn the piece on a bias. You have to see the entire piece that you're working on. Don't let it get under or behind or away from you. Put your finger behind to reinforce it. Don't let the key get bent. If the wheel grabs the side that's facing towards me, it's going to take it and spin it off. So turn it around and use your hand to cover this other side and come in and get the other edge. When you're coming across the hinge tube, come at a bias. Support the entire piece. Put your finger under the pad cup. Use your hand for reinforcement. I'm using white compound on this. These are nickel keys. So the white gives me the, the result that I want. So this is after our buffing. And these just look great. I love the way white looks on nickel. Let's go check our tenon corks. I've got a few coats of contact cement on my cork and a few coats, light coats, around the tenon itself. Now we're going to use this tool. It's like step gauged, but it will allow us to come in and measure the thickness of our cork so that we don't waste. This stuff is expensive, so you don't want to waste it. I'm going to go a little bit oversized and choose this side, the third step for my bell tenon. I'm going to line up that step so I've got the, the third notch. It's the width of my cork. Now I can just hold down Trying to do this where you can see. And make the cut. I got a little off, but I was showing you. That's okay, though. Okay. So that's a very handy little tool. I'm going to use this block for reference. I normally use the edge of my bench. But what we want to do is we want to make a cut at about 45 degrees. We're going to make this bevel cut coming across. And now we're going to put some glue, some contact cement on the top side of that you'll always know my courts because they're in the I use the center of the back is 12 o'clock we're gonna lay that bottom in where it goes and that bottom shoulder is the one that I'm keying off of. And we're going to rotate that around. And now it's going to glue to itself. I'm going to drag my razor right through for the cutoff. I'm going to push that down. Let's just going to let them set before I go to sanding. I'm going to repeat the process. Measuring market. it. 
Cut it. Bevel it. Light cement. Center it. Keep it on the shoulder. Run it around. Glue it to itself. Trim it. This last one is a little bit more than two, but less than three. I'm going to take the three. Okay. So everything is the same so far. Light cement. Bring this back. All right. Now we've got that started. Now I take my razor and I roll this right at the shoulder line. And now I've got a mark. And so I'm going to work the bottom shoulder as I put this in. Just like all the others. I'm going to trim this down. Here I've got my mark. And so... I'm going to use my blade and cut right at the shoulder. And that's how I'm going to do that. And this will all clean up when we dress it, when we sand our tenon corks. So now I'm going to let those set for, you know, five or ten minutes and we'll get back together. Now here's a little side tip. These are your cutoffs from your cork, from your tenon corks, right? These cutoffs typically match the foot cork thickness on your clarinet. Let's say that again. The foot cork, the cork between the body and the foot of the key, typically the thickness is the tenon cork thickness. And so you always keep these little remnants around. All right, I like to use a one inch sandpaper. I tear it in half, I use the bench peg to hold, and I start with where I cut with my razor blade. I want to smooth this down. Once I have this smooth, sometimes you can put this in a lathe and spin it, or you can just continue by hand. I try not to go all the way around. I try to use just a portion and come across and really pay attention to my strokes so that I keep an even, consistent thickness. The other thing that I want to do is I'm rotating my sandpaper back so back here on the back shoulder, I'm actually rotating back on it so that it brings into the shoulder and it cleans that up so very nice. And I just work my way around. On the front shoulder, I dip it forward, and I do the same thing. So I've made my tenon cork flat, and now I'm giving it some radius in either direction. And it just helps it have the original factory look. And it blends any of the outstanding cork into the tenon 
And to me, it just looks, it gives it a, a finished look. I stay off of the shoulder. I don't want to round that shoulder over. And then I want to give a test. Okay, so barely going on. Got a, quite a little bit of ways to go. And so now I'll be a little more aggressive. I'm still working this front shoulder. And I can see that I was a little bit oversized. I'm just being real careful to work just that cork. And you can see this is just a super clean edge. Really nice clean edge. And I'm starting to enter. Now I'm going to go on to the body or what I consider the body of the tenon cork. And I'm going to actually go flat now. And I'm going to go to a more uh, 180 degrees around but I'm gonna just flip the body a quarter turn at the time and then I'm gonna check again all right I'm going on you can see here that I'm going on about a quarter of the way I'm probably gonna do this one more time I'm shooting for my tenon cork to go on about halfway. That's what I like. That's the feel that I like. So as a dry fit, I want to be able to rotate it and I'll get about halfway on. If that makes sense. See about right there. But then it really binds up. But I'm about halfway. Okay, now I'm going to start working this back shoulder, and I'm going to get that really defined in. While you're really focusing on this back shoulder, you're, it's not hitting just here. It's hitting about to that halfway out. So it kind of just makes the whole thing give it a nice radius. And that looks really clean. I'm going to take my cloth. Get all the cork dust off of this. And this looks really nice. And this is dry. Okay. Why did I put the tenon corks on before I oiled the body? Why wouldn't you oil the body and then put the tenon corks on? That's two schools of thought. I don't think either one is right or wrong. This is the way I prefer to do it. When you oil the body, I have found that my tenon corks will peel back off. Cork grease, oils all that kind of thing, penetrate the cork into the wood and they lift off cork cement. So what I do is I use paraffin wax and I use that on my cork and I really coat it. So much that I can see it. I can see the white residue. And then I take my torch and I wave it over it and I melt it in. Can you see that? I hope that's coming through on the camera. Slowly. 
and you melt that paraffin in. Now the cork cement has got a layer of protection from the paraffin wax. So when I take some a dab of my cork grease and put on and spread around, so my joint goes together effortless. It's tight and it's just buttery smooth. And that's the way I like to do my tenon corks. So that they're clean, they're sealed, this looks really nice. And then when I oil the body, I'm not going to have a problem with this peeling off. So now I'm going to do the other two. Smooth as silk. I just love it when you just rotate it into place. Or if you've got it to be here, there's no rock in the tenon. You haven't taken anything off of the shoulder. The joint is nice and tight. You really get to where you don't even think about rotating your sandpaper anymore. <laughs> You'll also notice that I used a really long piece of sandpaper and I started down here. And as the paper gets clogged, I move to a new section, but then I'll go back. If I don't need to be as aggressive, I go back on a spot that is already, the pores are filled, and it gives it a more finished look. So sometimes I just need to take off a little bit, so I may go back to the already used section to give me a better finished look. If you have a hot air torch, you could also do it instead of the butane torch. I was using butane torches long before my hot air torches, so that's just what sits on my bench mostly. Okay, now here's another problem that you run into because you're, we're talking about feel. And so everything else was just really going on nice. But then this one, right here at the end of the shoulder, just really feels like it's, it's just binding up to me. Now, I've already put the paraffin and some cork grease on there. I'm just going to wipe that by hand. And I'm going to take... A fairly new little section and I'm just gonna work this back shoulder and I can see where the dip is in this cork right at the shoulder line just got a little bit much too much exposed so I'm gonna take that radius and make it a little bit greater Then we'll do the whole thing again. And now, yep, yeah, that's it. It goes on so smooth. It just twists beautifully on there. No rock. If you have to pull out, there's still no rock. Very little cork grease on there. And that's the way I like them. Okay, we're ready to put some oil on this body. When it comes to oiling the instrument, I don't want to overdo it. I use a flute cleaning rod with some cheesecloth wrapped around a couple of times. I test it to see that I can get under the register pip and not bind and then that I can get in around the thumb tube and I'm not real picky on how I do this I'll put a little bit 
on the brush or on the cheesecloth and then go in and do the insides first. I pay attention to put quite a bit around the shoulder. But I really want to make sure that I coat the inside good but light. And then I can look down. Let's see. It's pretty dry in there. I'm going to do my initial coats on the inside just like this. I'll work it in. Some people will soak the body in oil. I do not do that. I have done it. You can see the boar is soaking that oil up. Now notice. It's getting smoother. It's soaking in that oil and the grain is laying back down. It's going to seal itself back up. And I like to do this and then wait five or ten minutes and then come back, check it, and do it again. And I repeat this process until liquid stays on the surface. If I go 10 minutes and come back and the oil is still sitting on the surface, I know that the bore has taken all that it wants. And I wipe off the excess. See that? See how it's getting so smooth? And that's what we're after. And you can't properly oil the bore with the keys on it. They have to be off. I really didn't think that this one was going to need that much oil, but it seems to be a lot more thirsty than what I originally thought. See, look at that. Once I'm done with my initial coating for the inside, I'm going to take this and I'm going to do the outside. Paying particular attention to get all the chimneys, the tone holes, the whole bit. And you can see because of my excess that it's going on very thick. And cheesecloth is just really nice because it you can get into all the spots. I've tried a lot of the oils. And I've got quite a few favorites. I've been liking this Rocher Thomas that I get for Freeze a lot lately. Been using it a, quite a bit. I like the sheen that it gives to the instrument. It has good flow. And so we're really, really, you know, pretty caked on there. And now I'm going to wait and I'm going to let that soak in. And I'm going to repeat this process on the lower joint. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, I didn't get the posts and I didn't get the rings. I'm going to show you about that. There's a method to my madness, I promise. I'm going to let that, oops, let those sit in there. Let me show you something. So here's our barrel. I haven't buffed the rings. I haven't put any oil on it yet. That's just the way it looks. I want to show you this. I had already done this one. This is the bell. Look at how much depth of color and how clean the rings are. I have another technique that I use after the oil has soaked in and done its thing and it renders off this beautiful beautiful final product so that's what we're going for so we're going to wait and these are going to do their thing i'm going to work on this barrel and we'll catch up well all right we're going to call this 
part one. We're going to pause here. That's taken a whole lot of oil. I've already hit it two or three times so far. So I'm going to keep doing the same routine on that and we'll circle around. Then we have cork installation and finally pad installation. There you go. There are some other uh, videos on key refitting that are in the playlist for the clarinet. So if you're searching around, you can get there if you have questions or anything. And I hope you picked up some tips on this. Uh, if you have any tips to give out, leave them in the comments. Let's read about them. Everybody does things a little bit different. So this is just the way that I do them. Not right, not wrong. It's the way I've gotten accustomed to doing, the way I push myself to do things. So if you do something different, let's hear about it. Um, let's check it out. It might be something worth trying. Hope you're enjoying watching the clarinet overhaul. We'll get together on it again soon. I'll put the part numbers for all these really cool tools from Faris Tools down in the description, along with a link to their website. Get you some of these cool tools. Okay, till next time, this is Wesley, signing out.